Good evening, this is Quintus Curtius, and welcome back to the podcast. In this podcast, we're going to be talking about the trial of the astronomer Galileo. The trial of Galileo. And you may be familiar with this drama in a general sense. Maybe you don't know the specifics of it. We will go into the specifics. But it's an interesting and very, very uh, powerful human drama. And it brings into focus many issues that still are relevant in today's society. Issues of control, issues of power, uh, issues of freedom of expression, none of which can fail to lose their relevance for today's world. So let's talk a little bit about Galileo and the trial of Galileo. He, Galileo himself came to astronomy a little bit later in his life. He first established himself in other areas of scientific inquiry, especially um, uh, physics. And uh, in, the, in the early 1600s, he began to dabble in astronomy. He built, he, I think, according to the sources, they say he built his first telescope in 1609. And in August of that year, he demonstrated this telescope to some Venetian officials who were no doubt very uh, pleased and stimulated by what he had to show them. And the use of the telescope, as he began to build instruments of greater and greater power and was able to see deeper and deeper into space, this type of thing opened up entire new vistas for Galileo. He was able to see reams of of stars and heavenly formations. He discovered the um, four of the uh, nine moons or satellites of, of Jupiter. Uh, he discovered the rings of Saturn. And he was able to do all these things, which no one before him had really been able to see or, or to identify. And this type of thing, no doubt, um, caused in him the stirrings of intellectual ferment. He could not continue to accept the standard rule of the day, the required doctrine of the day, which was supported by the Catholic Church, which was that the earth was the center of the universe. The earth, according to biblical scripture, was the center of the universe and all of the other heavenly bodies revolved around the earth. And this, this, was, the, this was the view held by Ptolemy, the, um, the um, uh, Greek astronomer of late antiquity. And this was what the, the, the Bible said. Now, Galileo was aware of the revolutionary work of Nicholas Copernicus, who had published before him uh, a very, very controversial book, which he published safely after he died so that he, so that he would not have to deal with it, the fallout from it. Uh, but this book is essentially turned upside down the established order of things. It, it placed the sun at the center of the universe. And it said that the universe was actually heliocentric. In other words, the sun was the center, heliocentric. And the earth and other bodies revolved around the sun. And Copernicus had his own data to support this, and he had his own reasons. And this was obviously an extremely controversial theory for the time. And, you know, uh, but it's more complicated than that. Because if we actually look at the accounts written at the time, the church was not as uh, blindly repressive as it's made out to be. There was a uh, an understanding amongst the Inquisition, amongst the Jesuits, amongst those who, uh, the learned men of the church who looked into these things, that a scholar could teach the heliocentric view as long as it was treated as a hypothesis and as long as it was not proven. So there was an understanding, in effect, uh, that as long as scientists gave deference, at least gave official deference to the official interpretation, to the church interpretation, they would be left alone. They would be left alone. And this is something that we don't often see uh, commented on in text or accounts that talk about this issue. 
But even with this tacit understanding, even with this, oh, I guess we could call it this sort of, um, uh, you know, you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone type of arrangement, Galileo himself could not resist, either could not or would not stop in advocating the Copernican system, the heliocentric system, as a proven fact. And this is a, a view of his that hardened over time. Uh, he, uh, around 1615, he began to correspond with other scientists and with some other Jesuits about spots on the sun that he had, he had discovered. And he began openly to advocate for the Copernican system. Now, this, of course, crossed lines. This, of course, crossed lines. It brought him to the attention of the authorities in Rome, of the, uh, the Jesuits and the Dominicans who were in charge of monitoring uh, scientific activity, and they obviously were not um, were not happy. I mean, he opened then he openly began to to uh, to advocate heretical positions. And in one in um, in one writing, he said, "Nature is inexorable and immutable. She never transgresses the laws imposed upon her, or cares a whit whether the whether her abstruse reasons and methods of operation are understandable to men. For that reason, it appears that nothing physical which sense experience sets before our eyes, or which necessary demonstrations prove to us, ought to be called in question, much less condemned, much, much less condemned upon the testimony of biblical passages which may have which may have some different meaning beneath their words." Now this this was strong language, this was strong language. But Galileo was even more ambitious still. He was hopeful of being able to convert the new pope, Pope Urban the Eighth, to the Copernican uh, view of the universe, and he actually set out for Rome in April of 1624, hoping to convert the Pope to his ideas. And the Pope was very polite to him. The Pope uh, listened to him. Uh, by all accounts, he was very entertained. He took him seriously. And the church's position really at this time was, hey, you can, you can teach, you can advocate the Copernican system as long as you insert in your books, in your writings, some formulaic language that at least gives deference, that at least genuflects to the church's official position, that, that, that the Copernican system is a hypothesis and it's not proven. And this is really all they asked. And I, I, after going over the accounts, you can see that they really were impressed with him and they tried to make things as lenient as possible to him. But for whatever reason, Galileo either could not or would not um, restrain himself. And really the last straw was reached in 1632 when Galileo published a dialogue. It's a very has a very, very long title. I won't uh, repeat it. But um, it's, a, it's a dialogue between advocates of the Copernican system and adv advocates of the, uh, the Ptolemaic system. And of course, the advocates for the Ptolemaic system come off the worse in the dialogue and are look, made to look like fools. And this was the last last straw, really. Um, after this, Galileo was uh, was basically summoned by the Inquisition, and he was charged with having broken his promise to teach and advocate the Copernican system only as a hypothesis. And he was examined before the Inquisition. He he reached Rome in, in, in February of 1633. Now, he was subjected to days of questioning. Uh, there's no evidence that he was tortured. He may have been led to think that that was a possibility. I'm sure in some ways that he was probably leaned on in one way or another. But um, he was uh, examined repeatedly, and he... Uh, he hoped that the, the Pope, uh, Pope Urban VIII, would come to his aid. Apparently that never happened. And the Pope essentially abandoned Galileo to the Inquisitors. And they succeeded in, in forcing him to, to, um, to renounce the Copernican view of, 
of the world. He said, this is the, the, the words of his renunciation. He says, With a sincere heart and unfeigned faith, I abjure, curse, and detest the said errors and heresies, and generally every other error and heresy contrary to the Holy Church. And I swear that I will never more in, in the future say or assert anything which may give rise to a similar suspicion of me, and that if I shall know any heretic or any one suspected of heresy, I will denounce him to this holy office. And you can imagine how painful it must have been for Galileo to have to mouth these words. And his sentence, he was he was ordered essentially to be put placed under house arrest. Uh, his sentence was signed by seven different cardinals, although it was never ratified by the Pope, which I think is uh, significant. Now, there's a, a myth that he said when he was leaving the, the, the Inquisition. He said, oh, yet it, but yet it does move. This is... Uh, uh, almost certainly an apocryphal legend. We don't find it uh, before 1761, so it's almost certainly false, but it's a, it's a good story. But he was uh, he was confined to house arrest, and it was it was a humiliating uh, final denouement of a of a career that had been glorious in, in every respect but we can forgive galileo for having broken under pressure i mean who else uh, w what old man would have done anything any different and i'm sure galileo was aware of the burning of uh, uh, giordano bruno which had happened about 40 or 50 years before so i mean in the, people forget in those days the church was very powerful and if you crossed the official line, and if you were uh, influential enough and if your voice mattered, they were going to shut you down. They were going to shut you down, and it, it, uh, it was based on physical force. So that's the drama of the trial of Galileo, but it's often presented, it's often presented to, to students today as a heroic struggle of a lone genius against an oppressive evil system which sought to silence the truth and obviously there are that there is much there is much truth in this harsh indictment uh, you know no one today subscribes to this to the theory that the earth is the center of the solar system nobody believes that it's 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 demonstrably false but in a larger sense as time has gone on, we can have maybe not, um, maybe we can't justify what the church did, but we can at least have some understanding as to the reasons why the church took the line that she did with regard to uh, biblical uh, scriptures and inherited truths and, and theological uh, facts. The church saw itself as the guardian of public virtue, as the guardian of social order. And the Jesuits were not stupid. In fact, the Jesuits were very, very intelligent, very, very intelligent. And they said they knew, they knew deep down that this was not just a dispute among scientists over astronomical data. This was a question that cut right to the very heart of man's place in the universe. They knew that if the heliocentric view of the universe took root, that it presented a much vaster, a much more powerful and devastating challenge to Christian theology than any heresy from, say, Calvin or uh, Martin Luther or any of these other Reformation heretics. They knew that the heresy, that scientific heresy, was far more devastating, was far more powerful, because what it did was it displaced the earth from its central position in God's great domain. Because the Bible taught that God had created earth just for the abode of mankind, and that man was special, and that man was the instrument of God. And yet now, so it seemed, if the earth was just another ball of rock spinning aimlessly, uh, or in orbits, uh, you know, around the sun. If it was just one of many planets in the universe, if it was just uh, another rock drifting in space, then what would that do to the to Christian theology? It was you. You can see their point. It really dethroned 
man from his place as a central figure of nature to just another organism. So it was a it, it profoundly undermined theological doctrine. Now you can say, and I think a, a rationalist would probably argue today that what hey, what's the big deal? So so what? So the Copernican view is true. How does that really uh, threaten theology that much? How 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 does that? Who who cares? What's the big deal? Well, it was a big deal to them. It mattered to them. It may not. It, these disputes may not matter much to us today, because today we have different views. We can reconcile uh, science and religion together. We can see that they both have their place. We can see that both theology and both scientific inquiry uh, have their place in a healthy society and have their reason for existence. But this was not the view in the 1600s. In those days, people, well, maybe not everyone, but there was a prevailing view that the Bible was literally true. Every word was literally true. It was the inherited word of God. And that anyone who questioned that in a serious way was setting himself, setting himself up against God himself. This was the view. And in a much more practical sense, there were power issues at, uh, at play. The church had a monopoly in many ways on ed the educational system in many countries in Europe. And if different doctrines began to be taught and circulated, that would have been devastating to its uh, position as the guardian of, of, uh, of public virtue and as the, the transmitter of the educational legacy for the youth. So you can see what a great human drama this was. And I've only touched on it. It's a very, very interesting topic. It's a very inter interesting subject because it brings into play so many different issues that we talk about today. Issues of power, control, speech. And if you ever get a chance, you really should try to delve more into this issue if you can because it, it, uh, it brings into focus all of these issues that, uh, that I've just mentioned. But for now, this brief sketch will suffice, and I hope you've been, uh, I hope it's stimulated some thought for future exploration. All right, well, that'll be enough for now. I'm Quintus Curtius. Good night. <laughs>